to the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair. Renowned for her innovative designs and groundbreaking contributions to the field of architecture, Lina Lutme stands as a beacon of creativity and excellence in the industry. As the recipient of the prestigious Arab Great Minds Award for Architecture and Design in 2023, she has been recognized for her visionary approach to architectural design, particularly in her exploration of the dynamic interplay between architecture and nature. Throughout her illustrious career, Lena has demonstrated a profound understanding of the symbiotic relationship between the built environment and the natural world. Her designs seamlessly integrate natural elements such as sunlight, wind, and vegetation, creating spaces that are not only aesthetically pleasing, but also environmentally sustainable. Tonight, we have the privilege of delving into the mind of this architectural luminary as we explore her unique perspective on the dynamic interplay of architecture and nature. From her early inspirations to her most recent projects, we will uncover the driving forces behind her innovative designs and gain insight into how she navigates the ever-evolving landscape of architectural practice. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Lina Lrutme as we embark on this fascinating journey of discovery and exploration. Hi, Lina. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Alamira. I'm so happy to be with you uh, today. And thank you for all the organizers of uh, this book fair. It's such a great uh, pleasure to be in a, an environment of so much literary uh, words and uh, endeavors. Yes, I've been he coming here since I was a kid with my father, yeah. so it's nice to be among the books again. <laughs> it's amazing. It's really about our culture, like something that we will talk about and that is very dear to us as uh, Arabs and uh, also as an architect. It's uh, important. Yes, absolutely. Selina, I believe you wanted to start with a presentation, so the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really wish to uh, start uh, this talk actually by introducing uh, some of our works, uh, my practice in Paris and how we're looking at uh, nature in uh, architecture. And always, you know, when we're starting designing, we're always looking at Earth. Earth is our habitat, it's our house that we live in. And especially that today, you know, we are beyond even the Anthropocene because the human... Uh, us as humans became uh, really the governing power in the shaping of the world. And unfortunately, in our way of consumption and the, the economic construct uh, that we, we use to produce space, uh, we almost need more than two Earths to sustain us. And we always built with cement everywhere, towers, and uh, you know, we invade our environment. And we leave waste all the time. So it's really about how we can uh, think about material in a different way. How do we live with nature differently? And how we understand also that we can, are constituted of nature. And scientists actually tell us that we are more than 40% uh, constituted of microbes. So we're actually part of nature in a way. So that's what brings me always to question uh, the presence of nature in the large sense of the word in architecture. Uh, we can see it in uh, cities like Beirut, uh, like really coming through uh, the built environment, even in its most modest shape. And this is uh, something that uh, an ethos that I brought through different projects. This is the Estonian National Museum that we delivered in Estonia in 2016. And it's their national museum that talks about their culture. It is set uh, on a Soviet uh, ex-military airbase, and it dialogues with nature, and it tries also to, to bring nature as part of its architecture. Especially there, actually, I was faced with minus 20 in winter time. So how do you build in such an environment? And even the spaces became places for manifestation of uh, art that looks like nature, like this uh, big bear here. But when we build in extreme climates, we always learn to build differently. We learn uh, to build in a more sustainable manner, uh, where we consume less. So this project had to consume less energy, uh, live with uh, less maintenance, and have less exchange with its outside. It's 
uh, we hear the prayer also. <laughs> I continue. Uh, so we see also this uh, gown of this uh, building that is really coming uh, around it, protecting it. And again, also about architecture that is in synergy with its nature. So it goes like really dying into the ground and continuing that ground. Uh, when we see here like this uh, photo of this building in Beirut, which is a residential building, it's about really talking about a city that is built on itself all the time and really also bringing nature as it existed in many vernacular buildings in the past as part of architecture. This is a photo of Ottoman, Ottoman Beirut. And the whole building is about really working with the hand, bringing this uh, almost like an earth, uh, verticality of earth into the ground. So it really anchors us in the ground and brings nature as part of the building. We will talk about that relationship that is so important of nature in architecture. So like it's chiseling the whole facade by hand, also looking at, uh, you know, moments in Beirut where nature exists as part of the ruin and bring beauty in, uh, in the landscape and in the urban scape. So here also, like, maybe a question is how we can bring uh, different scales of nature as part of architecture. So every window has a different scale of nature. We have the small plants and then the larger plants that really grow vertically within uh, that building. So showing some of the photos about how it also uh, sits within its uh, urban uh, landscape. And sometimes when we build that way, uh, buildings become more resilient. So here when uh, the explosion happened in Beirut, the building really resisted that explosion and all the facades stayed intact, except for the glass, of course. Uh, and then we see nature also really being uh, anchored in that building without being destroyed. So it's playing between the vernacular, between the future, how do we find another language in architecture? Or this museum that is dedicated for artists who depicted the history of uh, Lebanon in that case, uh, that is stuck within the landscape of the mountains, and talking about that uh, also preciousness of the landscape that we see here, some of the photos of the place, here we thought about this museum as almost a home rather than just uh, an institution, a cold institution, but really a place where we are uh, invited to be uh, in a home like a Liwan, where all the artwork is sur surrounding us like a library. So it's about bringing interaction with that library, with that space, uh, and also thinking about the building as an ecosystem that collects water, uh, that allows nature to exist, that is active in its environment rather than a passive uh, element. This is uh, the lo first low carbon energy positive building in France. Uh, and it's in Normandy. And here we learn how to, again, foster that uh, role of building having a positive impact on their environment. And to do that, we build with local material. And here we use bricks because bricks is manufactured locally. We try to research the place, compact a structure, and using the earth of the site to build the project. So it's all the earth uh, that we use to make these bricks. We built 500,000 bricks and we used, again, uh, the traditional techniques, but also using contemporary technology to, uh, to build with uh, our knowledge today. We dried them and then one by one uh, they were used by the masons. Again, we taught the masons how to build again with brick. It was uh, like a craft that was forgotten. And then the building is talking about those also gallops of the horse. It's, it's a place where they make saddlery, it's for Hermes. So again, the building is inviting nature inside the, before even you enter uh, the, the inside of the building, you, you enter into nature. And all the materials used are natural. So they are bound to bro be brought back to earth afterwards some of the photos, so I, I won't go uh, more thoroughly on each of the photos, but just to give you a sense of uh, those spaces uh, of making here, like we can see also how it changes with the landscape and with the change of weathers. Now the landscape is uh, growing. It's also all the, for example, all the sites when we were doing all the digging, of course we had a lot of earth. We used all this earth 
to, pro like, to make the landscaping and use the plants to create an ecosystem, to foster for the ecosystem around. Some of the, uh, and even we had like um, bees, uh, honey, we could make in the place here. This is another project that is about sustainable feeding and again against waste of food and how to make a place where we can uh, really live, uh, plant and uh, teach how we eat in a more sustainable manner. Uh, so it's really about an ecosystem within the city of Paris. So how do we, in very dense urban environment, build again in wood, which is more biosourced, and allow the building to be a place of interaction between the different levels. And everything is about an ecosystem that no no nothing is wasted, everything is reused. On a larger scale, uh, like a stadium in Japan, and uh, like the stadium normally is a wasted space, uh, so how we can use the whole uh, stadium roof to become a park that is offered to the city of uh, Tokyo. Another scale of housing, again, the relationship to nature here, we can see. So really, like, uh, from the larger scale to the smaller scale, uh, to use natural materials, use earth here, like wood, and bring that closeness to nature through the multiple scales from the urban to the architectural and uh, to the object, as we see here. Yeah, I can run these photos, but let's start our conversation. Uh, I was going to tell you P. Yeah. <laughs> Code word. <laughs> <laughs> Lena, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I'm so excited to connect and talk about my two favorite topics, architecture and nature. So, you know, I've, I, I'm personally curious, and I'm sure the audience would be too, at how, you know, how did it start for you, this fascination with, you know, the intersection between architecture and nature? Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, um, I, uh, maybe I showed it slightly in the beginning, but, uh, you know, I grew up in Beirut. I left Beirut when I was 23. That was back in 2003. And you know, when you grow in a city that has lived the war, that has been buried seven times because of, earth, because of all the earthquakes, I grew up like on the seventh floor looking down at the city that is destroyed all the time. And uh, this desire came to rebuild in a way and to maybe think about a medium that can bring people together, but that can also bring beauty back to our environment. And I thought maybe architecture could be that uh, medium that brings us together, that brings beauty in a city. But I was struck also that nature, uh, in its presence in ruins, and we saw one photo with this ruin that is invading, uh, invaded by nature, brings beauty in a way, it heals. And so I was so attached to this idea that uh, nature is so essential for us as human beings uh, in our daily life, uh, in our urban environment, but also as a medium of linking us together. Uh, nature in a larger sense, it could be a desert, it could be a lush green space. We are, we are attached to that lived uh, environment that surrounds us and that makes us. Yeah, absolutely. So I imagine that that was sort of the starting point or the thread that led to your, um, you know, the, your conceptualization of the concept, uh, the archaeology of the future. Could you tell us a little bit more about that concept that you've come up with? Um, yeah, again, a link to Beirut, uh, as it was buried all the time uh, and uh, during the years of reconstru reconstruction, as soon as we, uh, we took out uh, the earth, we used to discover a lot of archaeologies. And I remember observing these archaeologists as were at work. And when they dig into earth and then they try to find the traces of our civilization, and I thought that it was amazing that how actually architecture and the built environment went back to earth. And this idea of really uh, becoming traces is really uh, conceptually very interesting uh, in a way, but also strengthens our tie to the environment, uh, to, to earth. Uh, and the work of an archaeologist is also one of uh, researching, of looking for a truth that uh, he or she are constantly in built, build, building it, you know, because there is no absolute truth. It's a history that we are reconstructing. And I thought I was interested in that process of research. 
And uh, I was also interested in the fact that this research doesn't become related to the past, but it's also something that could be projected in the future. And for me, archi architecture is that uh, discipline that allows us to be related to the past because it's a research-driven process, but that projects us in the future because every time we build something new, it's really related to a future that we discover, that or we uncover, or we offer. So it's, it's about the research-driven process, actually, of making architecture. That's so cool. Um, could you share, maybe, you, you shared a little bit, but is there a specific project where the design was inspired by the natural landscape that you want to maybe elaborate on a little bit more and how nature informed your design, design decisions? Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, it stops on this project, but maybe I can uh, show uh, more of it because this is the process actually behind this pavilion in London. This is the Serpentine Pavilion, and it's a pavilion actually that is built every uh, one year by a prominent architect, and it's just for two months, and then it moves. And the whole process started for me, like researching what could be relevant to build today, you know? And I was thinking about the importance of places to be together, and we started researching what brings us together. Like, for example, in this photo, we see earth, we see people cooking. Food. <laughs> food food is bring, brings us to, uh, together, but also food allows us to be grounded. You know, when you eat your home food, you feel like this kind of, uh, e like, uh, the, you know, happiness, and you feel how much we are climatic beings. So uh, this relationship to food is that uh, a reminder of how linked to our earth we are. And in that sense, I was interested in the concepts of food, of getting together around the table. We started researching, for example, in Greek times, the symposium was held on a table. So they used to sit uh, together, uh, like sit on the table, eat, and have uh, their major decisions made. Like in the majlis, actually, in our culture, we... I'm assuming this is pre-food coma. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone is sitting around, uh, sharing, you know, in a hospitality manner, eating and deciding. And so it's moments of assembly, moments of getting together. And we can see these assemblies happening, for example, in Stone Age, like because I was building in London, so I was looking at these uh, forms of Stone Age, what, what, can what kind of impact they can have on the design of the project as a place of talk, of assembly. And then uh, also other forms of Toguna. For example, here, like this uh, photo that we see, uh, is a Toguna structure. This is like a pavilion that the Dogon uh, people of Mali, uh, they build actually to, uh, to decide together uh, and together and decide on important decisions, to make the important decisions. So it's a heavy roof. They have to stay seated until they make that decision. Because if they stand up, they will bump their head, and so basically they cannot fight. So it's about how architecture can bring us into, you know, co community and agreement, like forms uh, like this, for example. And then the pavilion emerged from, these, uh, from this research and from echoing a natural form, like we see here, this uh, like flower that uh, I was drawing. So it's in a way, it portrays this idea of research and the archaeology of the form that will emerge. That's really beautiful, and I love flowers. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we're talking a lot about nature, and our profession, you know, has been seeing this increased interest in the concept of biophilia. Yeah. You know, just for the sake of our, the audience, would you uh, please provide us with a general understanding of what biophilia means? Um, and then describe maybe how you think biophilic design principles uh, ought to be utilized in, in architectural projects to promote human well-being and foster um, you know, a deeper connection to nature. Yeah. I, I was looking actually more closely at the like um, the definition of biophilia, some like uh, a domain and a word that actually is very present in my work, and I want to read it more literally, just because it's very interesting to um, to dwell on and think about. It's really an innate and genetically affinity to the natural world. So it means that genetically, actually, we are programmed with this uh, natural affinity to the lived world. 
and that we have actually this innate tendency to see connections with nature and other forms of life. So we do need life all the time. And it's about uh, this uh, relationship to the living things. It's really installed in our subconscious. It's rooted in our own biology. And that really our ancestors have an advantage because they were connected to nature. When reading about biophilia, you reali realize that 99% of our uh, lives, as uh, like uh, human life, let's say, uh, including our ancestors' life, is, has been built by nature and uh, as a mean of being adapt uh, adapting constantly to nature. Except, of course, the last decades and uh, decennae, where we have started to encroach on nature and to think that we can build our own environments independently of nature. So the idea of biophilia is to reconnect with that uh, concept of, uh, of this inherent need uh, to, to be in tune with the living uh, environment. And Psychologists, for example, they say that the, our minds are not suited to urban life. That you can imagine that actually we live in environments that are aggressive to us as uh, uh, as human beings, and that also ensure certain violence vis-à-vis -vis one another. And in that sense, indigenous cultures uh, were completely were much smarter than us in this relationship to the ecology and their uh, thinking, ecological thinking, actually. We were talking about that just uh, before, yeah. So go, and there is this reverence also towards the earth and nature that I think that we're, we're starting to slowly come back to, I think, but uh, I, I feel personally that we critically need to come back to that. Um, you know, we, we're talking about uh, connecting to earth and I think one of the things that we talk about or think about when it comes to architecture is generally it's a multi-sensory experience when you experience architecture you know you're touching smelling seeing things um, you know how do you leverage sensory design to evoke this deeper connection with nature I'd like to hear a little bit about that I think like what is important in sensory design or when we're thinking about the experience of architecture, for me what's important is that the architecture should be a reminder uh, that we are part of the environment and that uh, the architecture is an extension of us, of the environment. So in that sense, it's about uh, this capacity of uh, architecture inviting us to, uh, to feel our body, to feel our senses, to be able to touch. Uh, when we looked at the um, Stone Garden building in Beirut, uh, which is this residential building, the whole facade invites people to come and touch it and feel this connection, actually, that we have with our environment. And craft plays an important role in that sense. This hand, you know, the, our hands, our hands that link us to our intellect as well. So it's about also revising those industrial materials that we develop. Of course, we have to use technology. It's not about denigrating technology. It's actually going back to some uh, sometimes vernacular materials, implementing technology and pushing them to the future. Another side of sensory experience, for example, in the Serpentine Pavilion was the use of wood. I didn't expect that when people come in into that pavilion, they smelled wood. So they really felt like they wanted to stay in that place. They wanted to be, uh, you know, they felt nature. And, and that is a great well-being, you know, and the sensory experience becomes complete. We feel our attachment to the environment in, in that sense. Absolutely, and you also you touched on this, I think, in the in early on, um, how nature, you know, there is a beauty to nature. There is this essence of beauty, and you know, coming back to nature and architecture and this whole conversation we were having earlier, uh, you and I, um, that I want to relive actually for the audience. Beauty in architecture, I mean, it, it comes off as super subjective and you're talking about craft and the art of craftsmanship and, you know, we've, we're, we've in the modern days turned away from um, traditional ornamentation and the craftsmanship that really came with, uh, you know, the older uh, historical architecture. I mean, what are your thoughts around this? Um, 
concept of beauty, mm. let's say. That's a very interesting and large subject. <laughs> <laughs> it involves so many dynamics, actually. But let's touch on a few of them yeah. here. Um, I think, like, if we look at architecture in the past decades, beauty has been tabooed. I mean, you know, like, uh, the, the word even beautiful has been tabooed because, you know, you wouldn't say a place is beautiful or ornamented. You were seeking, like, a very uh, slick, uh, minimalist uh, architecture. And from my side, it actually detaches us from uh, our diversity. It detaches us also from our feminine side. You know, femininity is also about beauty, and it's so important to be present in our built environment. It's also about craft, you know, craft, the hand, the capacity of uh, connecting between our intellect and our hand. And ornament is not a crime. Because, you know, you, uh, Adolf Luz, uh, we used to say ornament is a crime. It's about really bringing back ornament as something essential in our, uh, you know, in our built environment. And sometimes, you know, when I'm in a natural environment, you look at a tree and you see how it branches off in a fractal way. Sometimes ununderstandable. Of course, it's governed by the laws of nature, but there is a sense of beauty, a sense of ornament in there, yeah. and that that's not superfluous. It's really essential in our experience uh, in in this full world. And as human beings, we're uh, also governed by our intuition. Uh, that uh, that is uh, maybe uh, substantiated by knowledge, but intuition is present. Emotions are there. So uh, we have to foster for those, actually, through the craft, through the beauty of architecture and our built environment. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking earlier, it's as much as the modern world was pushing us to you know, use more of our rational uh, mm -hmm. minds, you know, at the end of the day, as human beings, um, spaces evoke feelings yeah. and we can't deny them. You know, you can walk into a space, you could feel good, you could feel bad, and that's really what uh, your environment does. It contributes to your sense of well-being, whether, yeah. you know, intentionally or not, it, it happens. Um, yeah. So I think it's very important that, you know, we, we as designers, architects, urban planners are very intentional also about, uh, about this. Um, so... You know, we talk about sustainability a lot. I think it's thrown around a lot as a buzzword. So maybe, and obviously it's very present in your work. Um, so what would you say are the challenges of sustainability, um, you know, in architectural design today? Um, I think uh, drawing back also on the prior question and in transition to this question, I, I think like we, we think that beauty is luxury or it's just destined to a certain elite. I think it's a necessity. I mean, we need beauty to survive. I, I once wrote a text uh, in that manner because we need that beauty actually to bring us faith again in life. And beauty can exist in very simple ways and very simple materials. It's just about the care that we put in, a, in something we do and we build. Um, and when we're thinking about sustainability today, the challenges are, uh, first, is to change our uh, value system. You know, we have to start thinking about where we are investing and what investment means. It's not only about capital and uh, uh, financial investment. It's also about investing on a long term. It's taking the time to think about it and to think about our future, uh, researching um, or integrating research as part of our uh, design uh, practices. Uh, and I think uh, also, you know, it's about uh, building partnerships because as architects, it's not only us who are building the world. We build it with governments, we build it with clients, we build it with, sometimes they disappear behind us and when the building is not good and it's like the architect have done it. But it's not the case. It's always a partnership between different uh, people, disciplines that uh, share a vision together, together to build things uh, and our, like, uh, our environment in a more sustainable way. And this okay. is where the mantra, research should inform practice, comes into play. Definitely, Absolutely. of course, yes. Yeah. And also, uh, it's not a linear process. You know, in, uh, conventionally, we used to think that you design, you start with an idea, and then after you look for the material, and there's a bunch of people trying to, you know, draw what, uh, or realize what you drew. 
it's not the way. We're, we're starting sometimes with the material, so it becomes more a circular way of thinking rather than a linear way of thinking architecture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, your work often incorporates organic forms and materials. So, you know, how do these choices contribute to a sense of continuity with the natural environment? Uh, I mean, the natural world within the urban environment. Um, like, mm, the question of organicity is um, maybe too, like, uh, large. You know, how do we define an architecture that is organic? In my mind, it's not only about the form of a design, it's about the experience that you have within a design. It's about the organic experience that you can have. So when you're entering a space, you're able to move in a free way. You have a sense of freedom, but also the capacity in a place uh, to have the, cap the possibility of appropriating that space differently. So not only building functional spaces that are destined to sleep, to eat, or to, to, you know, to, to work, but also places that allow you contemplation, that allow you other activities that the architect has not thought about uh, to occur. And this has been recurrent in uh, my work. Like uh, sometime I offer a space that is in between, uh, you know, a place where there's a tree or like a sunshade or... So, so in a way it becomes a place where people use it in unexpected ways. And maybe another aspect to organicity is also the capacity of a building of being uh, used differently in the future. Because even the way we are using spaces today is evolving. So today, an office building can tomorrow become uh, maybe a museum or it becomes a housing. So really having the capacity of building uh, our uh, you know, architecture and our uh, built space to be flexible for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, generic question, but can you just give us maybe a little bit of an idea of how using sustainable building materials and eco-friendly construction techniques um, in our architectural projects, like how, how do those contribute uh, to reducing the environmental impact of buildings? Um, well, it's uh, basically, it's all about carbon footprint in the beginning, you know, it's uh, when you're using a material, uh, one has to start thinking that every material has an impact on the environment. And our goal is to have a positive impact. So positive impact it means that it has a low carbon footprint. We know that carbon is the main uh, driver today, uh, before, like without getting into the, disc the, the, the description of the complexity of, uh, of uh, you know, what creates global warming, because it's not only carbon, but uh, it is one of the triggers, actually, of the uh, global warming. So basically, we have to reduce our impact. So we have to measure every material we are using. We have to also think about the life cycle of, the mate of materials. So every material has to be able to go to Earth. You know? And as soon as you think this way, you start using wood, you start using Earth again, you start thinking about materials that are able to disintegrate, as we do. Uh, we think about geosourced materials like uh, stone construction because it's here for millennium that we can reuse it. And if we are bound to use plastics, which are, you know, uh, very carbon, uh, have a heavy carbon footprint, it's about reusing what exists, you know, you're reusing it. So it reduces actually its carbon footprint uh, in the fact that it's not thrown as a material, reducing waste. So everything becomes a resource in that sense. And we start to feel the importance of having um, the possibility of measuring each material. So here we need technology to, be, uh, to allow us to measure all the time the materials that we use. And its lifespan and durability, and it tells of you how course. Yeah, yes. it can and, be reused. And also, you uh, thinking about material like uh, buildings as uh, banks of material. It's almost like you have a building, but uh, the building, every material you are you are using in, uh, is a resource. So at some point, you can dismantle the whole building. You can reuse all of the materials. It's not like a fixed structure. It's perennial structure that is constantly in reuse. Yeah, and then you're also reducing wastage. So, of course. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, we're almost there. I'm done grilling you very soon. 
Um, I think we're still good on time. Um, what challenges would you say, you, or how do you navigate this tension between the built environment and the preservation of you know, the natural uh, habitat in your architectural projects? It's like a delicate dance, I believe. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. It's like a delicate dance. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the uh, basically the the challenge is to think about the construction and the architecture uh, as a positive impact. So as soon as you think it this way, it's not anymore a challenge to build. The fact that we actually built today uh, in in a way to encroach on our environment and in a way that buildings have a negative impact on their environment, they're energy vor, they eat up energy, uh, they're not uh, built to last, uh, etc., makes us think that it's a conflict, a constant conflict. So it's about shifting our view, thinking that we have to build in a positive way. The, the, uh, you know, the effort of building, it's a lot of effort, the number of people building, so this uh, act has to be positive, has to ha be worthwhile. That's what I believe and I say to my team uh, always. We have to like, uh, make it worthwhile to uh, make an architecture. So in that sense, we have to have a positive impact. So the building has to, have, uh, has to be low carbon, it has to be energy positive. And I'm really eagerly seeking always partners to do that, you know, to build uh, such exemplary buildings that, that prove actually that, uh, that we can have positive impact on our environment, be symbiotic, live in a symbiotic relationship to the environment. Yeah. You put that out there in the world, let's see where it catches. Yes, <laughs> whoever has this ethos, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're talking about partnerships and I think one of the most important partners, in my opinion, is the community that you're building for, yeah. right? So how important is it for you to, um, you know, to bring the community in, uh, you know, have them participate, raise environmental awareness, um, you know, on, on these architectural projects? And, you know, what kind of strategies can architects employ uh, to inspire communities to adopt more sustainable uh, living practices? This is a great question because I think like in the beginning, architecture has to become a culture. You know, many people don't know necessarily what is architecture if you're not in the discipline or interested. Sometimes they ask me, so what do you do? What projects you specialize in? Uh, do you do uh, houses? It's, it's really, uh, I mean, architecture is about, you know, fashioning the environment and uh, fashioning our relationship to one another. So it is essential that we build that architecture culture. And maybe an example to that is a museum that I'm uh, working on and designing uh, in Al Ula. It's the Contemporary Art Museum uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the idea here, or the, the question that I, I asked myself before starting this museum is what a museum is actually in Saudi. What is a museum in Al Ula? You know, it's a place where there are uh, people living there, a community uh, in this place. So who is the community? So before uh, designing anything, I went to meet the people that are living in the city uh, that have been there. I went to schools uh, like uh, kindergartens and boys' schools, girls' schools, started asking them, what is a museum for you? And I was struck uh, to see the maturity of children, you know, some of them telling me the museum is a place of extraordinary. It's, this is amazing, you know, that they have this maturity to say that it's a place to, to dream. Of course, some of them were telling me it's a place for dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> like uh, when Nikteshef uh, Faizam at Dinosaurat. So it was really great uh, first encounter, having them draw. And then I started building the vision for that project through this encounter, but also thinking about this design as a tool to build the link with the community. For example, we see there a great knowledge in earth construction that has been forgotten the past uh, decades. And the idea is to use that museum to be able to reinstall that knowledge of earth construction, to work with the artisans locally, to bring them back uh, in link to their heritage, uh, to the historic city. So really allowing this building to become a vessel, even in, in the construction process, to build knowledge through architecture. 
That's so beautiful. <laughs> Huh? Really? We're trying. Um, Let's no, really, I can't wait to go see it. I mean, I wanted to go see Alorla, and now I have even more reason to go. Um, so last question to wrap up before we open the floor to any Q&A. Um, how do you envision the architecture of the future? This is a question I'm always asked, actually. What is the architecture of the future? People start thinking that we will have, uh, you know, vessels flying around and <laughs> huge towers. I think like architecture of the future is the architecture of the present first. You know, it's about what we are building to last for the future, how we construct today to build the future instead of, you know, thinking about an image of the future that is an unknown that we are constantly building without, uh, you know, that, that becomes also an image, a superfluous image. I would say there's a lot to do in the present, you know, in our ground before we leave to the moon, uh, you know, how we can <laughs> make it much better uh, here. Uh, then, uh, you know, then thinking about, uh, you know, images that we are less uh, in control of today. Yeah, no, that's poetic <laughs> and beautiful. Um, Thank you. So I think we'll just open the floor really quick if there's any questions from the audience. Um, Otherwise, we'll, yeah, go ahead, maybe. Thank you. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah, great presentation. Mashallah, beautiful work. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate how you have that uh, sensitivity towards nature and the vernacular. It's very beautiful. But I have a question. You know, today, we have artificial intelligence that's hugely impacting the way architecture is being formed and presented and brainstormed to a client. So I'm just curious, how would you combine that or use that as a tool to complement that vernacular, you know, uh, touch to architecture? Thank you for your question. I mean, I always think about uh, technology and AI as a tool, you know, that allows you to move for further. So if you can use AI as a way to, uh, you know, calculate the performance of your building, to respond, for example, in a specific location, uh, what's the best bioclimatic shape that you can emerge in a context, taking in advantage the wind, the sun, the, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, seasons, that's great. You know, you can use AI to do that. Today we use uh, programs, maybe they are not as fast. We have iterations where things take more time to be able to reach that bioclimatic shape. Because when we're th building bioclimatically, actually we're already reducing our need in terms of energy uh, intake, in terms of energy climatization, heating of a building. So this is a slight example how AI can help us. And I think it goes beyond, uh, you know, mid-journey or other programs that allow you uh, to do those uh, slick images. It's about really using the tool in its sense, in its deep sense, that uh, allows us to move forward in our way of conceiving architecture. And we always use uh, need us as humans because we will uh, live into that in in these spaces. It's very very reassuring to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I hope agree. so. Let's see in uh, 20 years, you'll ask me the question. and uh, Hopefully, and you know. Thank you so much. Great, great talk, guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> yeah. um, Lina, it has been really such an honor. Thank and you a so much. I love our uh, conversation. I'm so honored fun. to be uh, talking with you. El Amir Arim, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time, for sharing your mind with us and your philosophy. So I hope it was a, as great of an evening for you as it was for me. Thank you, everyone, for your being here, your presence, your attention. Um, the session is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.